Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, technical webinar session. Today, the topic is a structural assessment of the Garrison Dad Tower. And uh, we, Diana Effie, we are very proud to uh, welcome uh, Stefano uh, Inverzini, uh, Associate uh, Professor of the Structural Mechanics of Polytechnico di Torino. And uh, Pedro Marin Montanari is a PhD student. Uh, today, they will, be, they will be the two uh, lecturers of this uh, presentation. And uh, we are very proud to have them uh, today as a guest uh, lecturer for our uh, technical webinar. Before we start, uh, let me just uh, briefly tell you uh, how things are going to, uh, to work. So during the whole uh, session, your microphone will uh, remain muted uh, to avoid any background noise uh, disturbance. But you have the possibility to uh, raise or address your questions in a question box. So you can type the question over there. I will keep an eye and monitor the, the questions if they are coming. And uh, if there are uh, questions that are relevant for the whole audience, uh, I will uh, raise this question at the end of the session uh, to uh, Stefano and uh, Pedro. Uh, this session will be uh, recorded. And uh, in a few days' time, uh, when information has been validated, we will uh, probably uh, put it on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you will uh, be able to uh, replay it uh, at any stage. So, uh, having said that, I'm going to ask uh, Stefano to uh, unmute uh, his microphone, and I would like uh, that all of you, you uh, join me to welcome uh, Stefano and Pedro, and uh, we are very uh, interested and uh, curious to uh, listen to their uh, presentation. Stefano, the stage is all yours. Uh, thank you, Jean-Claude, for the kind introduction, and... Um... As, uh, as Jean-Claude already told you, um, I want to welcome also everybody that uh, is uh, here in us. The, the, the name of the, the title of the technical webinar would be Structural Assessment of the Garizenda Tower. Uh, before starting, I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, research collaboration, first of all, of Professor Carpinteri from Politecnico di Torino and Professor Lacidonia, and of Professor Angelo Di Tommaso from Alma Laurea in Bologna. Then also I want to thank the collaboration of the municipality of, the, of Bologna, Italy, and uh, also uh, the, um, the works of several uh, firms involved in structural earth monitoring uh, collaborating to study the, the tower. The um, outline of our presentation uh, will be uh, a brief uh, introduction. Then uh, I will uh, spend some words about laser surveying and non-destructive monitoring of the tower. I will uh, tell you about uh, a first series of uh, numerical uh, simulation that we carried out. And then I will uh, uh, pass the, the microphone to Pedro that uh, will uh, tell you and show you some new results about thermoelastic numerical simulation with the greater details of the tower that we are currently carried on. Uh, carry on. We will try to, uh, let's say, conclude, but uh, also during the presentation to provide some discussion about the uh, results that we uh, were able to obtain. The uh, Garizenda Tower that you can see in the, uh, in the slide here on the left, to, together with the nearby Asinelli Tower, that is uh, this one on the right, is certainly an icon of the city of Bologna that used to have more than 100 mesory towers at the end of the 12th century. Nowadays, of course, uh, there are a few of them uh, survived. The Garizenda Tower was built around 1109 by the local, local wealthy family name named Garisendi. The initial height of the tower was around 60 meters, 
but then the tower was subsequently shortened because of structural stability issues. Nowadays, sorry, nowadays uh, um, the tower is uh, uh, 48.6 meters tall and shows an impressive overhang of about 3.2 meters due to the differential settlements of the foundation soils. Although the nearby Asinelli Tower is almost twice as high as the Garisenda, as, uh, is almost twice as high, the Garisenda always provided a great impression on the observers, observers, such that even Dante Alighieri mentioned it in his Divina Commedia, comparing it to the mythological giant Anteo. During its history, the tower suffer, suffered from several damaging sources, such as seismic, se, seismic events, thermal cycles, wind, and more recently, also the effect of traffic, urban traffic. The structural behavior, behavior of the Garisenda Tower has been studied since the beginning of the uh, previous century and has been continuously monitored with different non-destructive techniques, including acoustic emission that was, uh, uh, let's say, granted by Politecnico di Torino Group during, during the last decade. In this slide, you can also uh, see um, drawings of the tower. Uh, we, I reported a couple of uh, uh, lateral view and a couple of sections. Uh, inside, you can see uh, internal stairs that are uh, made of, uh, uh, initially was uh, um, a wooden structure, now it has uh, been replaced by a steel structure, but very light one. The tower was being subject of a terrestrial laser scanning. Uh, the municipality of Bologna commis commissioned this study in occasion of the retrofitting of the external ashlar wall, this part of the tower. Although the same technique has already been exploited also a decade before, the laser survey provides an extremely accurate geometrical description of the tower envelope, with error compressed in very few millimeters, sorry. Um, the survey is based on the analysis of hundreds of millions of acquired points that uh, can be uh, further synthesized in a detailed architectural drawing as shown in the previous slide. Those are the results of the uh, analysis of the laser scanning uh, survey. On the other hand, collecting information about the internal structure of the tower requires for different approach, approaches. Uh, among them, uh, the tower has been subjected to thermographic investigation using infrared camera to check the humidity of the internal and external masonry surface. Three-dimensional, and this is shown in this picture, electrical tomography survey for the electrostratigraphy characterization of the wall section, especially at the, at the base of the tower, that is, uh, of course, uh, the region of the tower that is mostly, uh, let's say, loaded, to obtain information on the state of conservation and on the ongoing degradation processes. Then also georadar and penetrometric surveys were performed to identify the presence of voids 
and to identify the physical mechanical characteristics of the foundation soils. Continuous monitoring with acoustic emission uh, technique, the sensor were placed in different points in the uh, internal cavity of the tower, have been applied, uh, sorry, have been carried out uh, and the, this, uh, let's say, monitoring was in charge of Politecnico di Torino. Um, more, or in, in addition, sorry, in addition, um, real-time strain, strain measurements with uh, optical strands system by Osmos uh, placed inside of the tower were also carried out. And uh, finally, the tower has been also equipped with a pendulum for the real-time measurements of eccentricity evolution and uh, also additional displacement sensors in correspondence uh, of the corner of the external corner of the bay of the base of the tower together with the uh, measurements of uh, temperatures uh, were also put in place combining the different results uh, allow to obtain an accurate picture of the tower's wall stratigraphy, especially at the base level, as is shown in the slide. The stratigraphy in, uh, in this, uh, let's say, section uh, of, the, of the tower is uh, as follows. Uh, starting from the uh, inside, there is a first uh, uh, layer of uh, intact gypsum rock, um, this kind of rock is called selenite. Then there is a quite wide layer of sacco, so-called sacco, which is an heterogeneous conglomerate made of different kind of stones and masonry. Bind it together with light, uh, uh, um, let's say, cementitious matrix. And then again, there is a, um, another layer of gypsum rock, an external layer of more degraded selenite, and then finally, in the exterior of the, uh, let's say, uh, lower level, there is, uh, there is also the ashlar wall. Here you can see also a couple of features from the endoscopic image, which served together with other kind of indirect, uh, let's say, assessment of the um, stratigraphy of the tower to, uh, let's say, to um, define the different layers. In addition, internal and external uh, temperature uh, were uh, acquired continuously during the last years. Uh, today, I will spend some uh, time to describe this uh, monitor temperature monitoring in detail, since it will be the input for the numerical simulation that we will present. Uh, this diagram shows the temperature acquired by two thermocouples placed about half of the height of the tower, uh, respectively uh, inside. Here is uh, the, the picture of the uh, sensor of the thermocouple and outside of the tower, uh, respectively. In this diagram, only the results of the last here is show, are shown for the sake of clarity, but uh, we have uh, um, data from the entire last decade available. It is easy to, to recognize from this diagram the uh, typical season, uh, seasonal temperature cycle during the uh, winter months, the temperature inside and outside is, uh, is lower 
and the opposite is uh, during the uh, summer months. Uh, I want to um, to stress the fact that uh, um, from the um, let's say from the thermodynamical point of view, the tower is a, a completely passive building because uh, it's not heated uh, artificially and. Uh, um, the sun is the only reason of this, uh, let's say, variation, seasonal variation. Another observation is that uh, the mean external and uh, internal temperature are uh, almost equal and equal to 15 degrees. Uh, all the uh, thermal analysis that we will uh, present are differential, uh, let's say, um, analysis with respect to this mean temperature. Uh, it is finally it is also possible to note that uh, especially the external temperature uh, that is the, depicted in yellow is characterized by uh, a multitude of spikes. These spikes are corresponds to the uh, daily temperature uh, cycles caused by night and day alternation. In the first stage of the analysis that we carried out, we decided uh, to simplify this picture. We decided to uh, select uh, four critical uh, configuration. Uh, these four critical uh, configuration correspond respectively to, uh, in this uh, first diagram, the warmest day of the year, in the sense that uh, is, the, uh, is the day of the year that uh, with respect to the mean temperature, uh, the external temperature reach the highest value, the highest peak, okay? This day, of course, uh, occurs in, uh, uh, during the summer season. The second critical uh, scenario that we consider is, uh, was the uh, coldest day of the year. With respect to uh, 15 degrees that are a, a bit out of scale in this diagram, you see that uh, is the day where we uh, have the minimum uh, temperature. The other two uh, scenarios correspond respectively to the maximum positive temperature differences uh, between external and internal, and the, uh, on the other way around, the minimum, the maximum negative temperature difference of the year, again, with, um, among, um, between internal and external. Okay. Uh, the third configuration takes place uh, during spring season, and the last uh, instead uh, takes place usually during the fall season. Then we uh, build up a, a three-dimensional finite element model, uh, of course, with the uh, Diana software taking advance of the uh, functionality of the Diana integrated environment. The geometry was discretized with about 60,000 quadratic solid elements connecting uh, about uh, 200,000 nodes. This model is compliant with uh, uh, the uh, laser scanning survey. We accounted for the openings in the tower, while the internal wooden or, and metallic structure and uh, the presence of uh, some uh, stiffening steel uh, reinforcement have been omitted for the present time. We uh, took uh, into uh, consideration and we provide uh, accurate uh, description 
of the layered structure in the tower. So the, uh, the sacco layer, for example, in, in green in this picture, and the other uh, layer of masonry and uh, uh, selenite. We uh, adopted uh, um, some, uh, um, let's say, physical and mechanical parameters that are shown uh, in, in, this, uh, in this table. Now we can uh, skip, uh, oh sorry, I forgot to say that uh, in our model we accounted also for uh, part of the surrounding soil, uh, foundation soil, okay? And, uh, and also in addition, of course, uh, since uh, we uh, are about to show uh, thermomechanical results, uh, together with uh, uh, density and uh, mechanical properties, elastic properties, uh, we adopted also uh, values for the thermal conductivity. First, I want to show you uh, some uh, few results, uh, uh, let's say a mechanical uh, assessment on the tower. Um, in, in, in recent years, the tower uh, has been subjected to operational model analysis by the other uh, authors. And uh, these, allowed, these results allowed us to uh, validate our model and the assumption of the mechanical parameters uh, we made, comparing the calculated model frequencies with the experimental one. Here you have uh, three uh, different, the, the first three, let's say, uh, mo um, eigen, uh, eigen shape and uh, eigen frequency. Uh, what we can see is that we have uh, a very good uh, uh, correspondence uh, with the first and the second uh, uh, eigen uh, frequency. Um, and the, let's say the error the discrepancies with respect to uh, experimental model analysis is lower for a percent. Instead, uh, it's more, much more uh, com complex and uh, difficult to match the first uh, torsional natural frequency. Okay, we were uh, aware of this difficulty since uh, we studied in, uh, in, in recent years also the uh, Asinelli Tower, and we, uh, let's say, developed in that occasion a, a possible explanation of the phenomenon due to uh, the presence of uh, subvertical uh, cracks. But uh, if any of you uh, would like to uh, know more about uh, this technique, can take a look to another webinar uh, we uh, provided uh, for the Diana group that can be found in the uh, Diana uh, YouTube channel or directly at the link uh, that is shown in the slide. We also analyzed the, uh, the tower uh, subjected to the effect of gravitational acceleration. We started from the uh, tilt uh, configuration obtained by the survey. And as a result, the calculated overhanging slightly overestimated the actual one. The amount of the calculated elastic displacement for the top of the tower in the southeast direction is equal to about 3% of the permanent displacement due to the permanent foundation tilt. This means that the elastic, uh, let's say, displacement of the tower in the horizontal direction is still a very small percentage of the amount that is due to uh, non-elastic, uh, let's say, settlements in the foundation of the tower. 
The compression uh, stress at the ground level in correspondence of the east side of the tower, which is uh, the uh, most, uh, um, let's say, compressed, is around 2 megapascal. In this picture, we made use of a flipping plane to uh, make uh, more readable the diagrams because uh, in this case contour plots with uh, with solid models are not uh, easily uh, understandable what you can see that you have uh, greater uh, um, compressions uh, in the in the side uh, in, in towards the leaning of the tower and on the other side uh, very small uh, uh, compression or even slight uh, traction on on the uh, on the opposite side okay which is the side where the entrance of the tower is uh, placed this means that uh, the neutral axis if we reason uh, uh, let's say uh, assuming as a section of the tower is placed more or less in this uh, position <coughs> Close to the corners, we have also, um, let's say, higher uh, tension and the uh, compressive stress uh, reach 2.12 megapascal. Uh, we, we, uh, we can, uh, uh, let's say, note that the maximum stress in the external uh, selenic stone in this position is very close to uh, the level at which the stone, when subjected to a uniaxial compression test in laboratory, begin to emit acoustic emissions. If compared with the value of a, a selenite stone compression strength assumed by other authors that studied the, the tower the calculated stress is admissible with a safety factor that is uh, equal to 1.9 the maximum tensile stress on the opposite uh, side uh, is less than 0.1 megapascal which is about one fifth of the expected tensile strength of the uh, of the stones in that position note that due to the variable cross section uh, in the tower uh, the, the, the maximum uh, uh, tensile stress is not located as uh, for the compression one at the base of the tower but uh, is uh, located a little bit higher in this position uh, where the um, let's say cross section of the tower is slightly lower than at the base a second uh, an, an, a following analysis was performed accounting the effect of the wind load only we performed a, a series of, uh, uh, um, say, preliminary uh, elastic analysis to uh, assess the uh, order of magnitude of uh, stress in the tower. The wind pressure was assessed according to the uh, expected uh, uh, wind thrust according to the Italian standards. Uh, we assumed for the wind uh, uh, the direction that was, uh, let's say, the same of the uh, leaning direction of the tower uh, in order to increase the amount of the load uh, due to uh, permanent overhanging the amount of maximum displacement at the top of the tower in this position is equal to 11 percent the corresponding elastic displacement due to permanent loads so it's very small okay the increase in compression that we can see in this position uh, in the south side of the tower is equal to 0.1 megapascal 
which is about 5% of the amount due to permanent loads. The same can be said about the tensile stress on the opposite side. We have a, a slightly higher value in correspondence to corner uh, side, close to the entrance. Uh, this, uh, let's say, these results, uh, this uh, very small effect of the wind thrust uh, is in good agreement uh, with uh, the fact, uh, for example, that, that uh, um, acoustic emission are very poorly correlated with uh, uh, wind velocity. And then we come to the uh, thermoelastic uh, uh, analysis. We considered the, the four uh, scenario that I mentioned before, taking uh, 15 degrees Celsius as a reference temperature, and uh, we uh, performed a, a staggered thermomechanical analysis, which means that the first steady state heat transmission problem is solved, which provided the temperature fill in, of the structure. We assumed a constant temperature for the outside of the tower and a constant temperature for the inside of the tower. This uh, uh, gross approximation, uh, we will show, Pedro will show you in the following of the presentation, can be, uh, let's say, uh, refined uh, considering a, a better distribution, a more, uh, let's say, precise distribution of temperatures. But uh, for the moment, uh, I will show you these uh, first uh, results. And uh, uh, um, as I was saying, first, the steady state heat transmission problem is solved, which provide, as shown in the left uh, part of the slide, the, temp the steady state temperature field in the structure. Of course, also this one is a, a quite, uh, uh, let's say, strict assumption. Uh, but uh, let's say we are we are still, uh, and let's say, trying to uh, to see if uh, uh, um, trans um, the trans transitory problem could be relevant or not. After the uh, the field of uh, let's say temperature uh, is used is uh, obtained sorry the uh, corresponding uh, imposed deformation are given to the uh, solutor to uh, solve the elastic uh, problem and to obtain uh, the corresponding state of stress and uh, elastic deformation which is necessary to uh, accommodate, let's say, uh, deformation which are not uh, congruent and can not be, let's say, accommodated directly by uh, movement of the tower. Um, during the coldest day of the year, the calculate stress, thermal stress is very limited. Okay, we, we can see in this side. Tensile stress, stresses appear close to the external wall, whereas compression stresses are loca located closer to the internal wall in correspondence to the uh, base corners. The other way around is uh, the scenario of the warmest day of the year. In this case, the total external temperature reaches 35 degrees uh, when the internal temperature is only about 29 degrees. Everybody that had uh, the chance to visit the tower know that uh, when you come inside and it's on summer, it, it's much uh, more comfortable inside than outside. Like an air conditioning. It's a natural air conditioning. The configuration as I was saying, is opposite to the previous one, with compression stress in correspondence of the external walls, okay? And the amount can reach 0.16 megapascal. Uh, in, uh, in this side of the uh, tower, 
they will sum up with a, a confession in, uh, due to uh, permanent loads. And you see here the confession. Okay. Uh, we still have a couple of uh, scenarios. Uh, during springs, uh, uh, take place uh, the day with the maximum positive temperature difference, which was uh, uh, around uh, 13 degrees Celsius. And this situation is, uh, in some sense, analogous to the previous one, in the sense that uh, the distribution of temperature and corresponding deformation, sorry, uh, and corresponding deformation uh, provide that uh, elastic uh, deformation and stresses are compression on the external side of the tower. But the amount of the uh, additional compression due to thermal stresses is lower than the previous one and, uh, sorry, is higher and uh, uh, equal to 0.5 uh, megapascal. The last uh, uh, configuration is the, the maximum negative temperature excursion. And uh, of course, as uh, let's say you can guess, uh, the situation is uh, the opposite of the maximum positive uh, difference. And in fact, we have uh, tension that sum up uh, to the, uh, let's say, permanent load situation. So in some sense, uh, this uh, configuration provide a more critical, sorry, more critical uh, situation in the uh, north side of the tower. How can, uh, let's say, interpret these uh, results? But first, of, first of all, we can uh, observe the numerical models uh, appears uh, not only useful uh, to provide a more reliable structural assessment of existing structures, but also to uh, better understand the outcome of non-destructive technique monitoring. Especially in this case, uh, we uh, compare it with the uh, um, correlation with the acoustic emissions. The magnitude the magnitude of compression stresses provided by the finite element uh, model combining the effect of permanent loads and temperature gradients especially for the maximum positive temperature configuration reveals that uh, the acoustic emission are likely to occur in this uh, scenario and this is in good agreement with uh, both the laboratory test performed on uh, uh, stone cores, but also with the uh, in situ experimental evidence coming from uh, uh, acoustic emission monitoring. The numerical calcul calculation show also that the stress increment due to the wind thrust is uh, quite limited and mostly unable to provide crack propagation in the mesonry, coherently in this case with the poor correlation between the wind speed and the in situ recorded acoustic emission. Now I leave the floor to Pedro that will talk to you about some more detailed thermoelastic numerical simulation that we are currently carried on. Okay. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, thank you, Jean-Claude, and thank you, uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining this, uh, this webinar. So as Stefano said, um, I'm going to dive into uh, some uh, other kinds of thermoelastic uh, numerical simulations that uh, we performed with Diana. I'm going to start by giving you a context of what we were trying to do and uh, I will also show a bit uh, how we implemented the, this problem in uh, Indiana. So also if someone ha um, has faced the problem of trying to set up a thermal simulation and um, 
want to have an idea of uh, what can be done with the software, uh, we will provide a, a little bit more of uh, details. Uh, so for this part, um, the, the Garicenda, as uh, Stefano mentioned, has uh, many different um, measurement systems uh, and uh, sensors to uh, capture all kinds of behavior. One of them is a pendulum that is inside the tower and it's actually quite an amazing engineering feat because it's a uh, 30 meter long pendulum that is responsible to measure the, the planar movement of uh, the tower. And um, one thing that we wanted to, to know, to see if we can understand uh, performing uh, these kind of simulations is uh, what are the, the causes of the movement? Because it's a quite complicated problem. Uh, as Stefano said, we have um, thermal loads, we also have uh, traffic, we also have wind, we also have uh, seismic effects, we also have uh, creep because it's a thousand year old tower. So it's, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what, uh, what effects are, are more uh, important in, in, uh, in some of the, um, some, let's say some of the mechanical behaviors of the tower. And uh, we wanted to see, so we, uh, with, uh, with the thermoelastic uh, simulation, if we could uh, get a good idea of the, this movement and uh, the thermal effects. And uh, why does it uh, make sense? Well, here we can see um, a video. Oh, wait, let, let me see. Okay. So um, during summer and winter, but also during uh, the day, the tower is subjected to, um, let's say, various thermal conditions. So we can see we, we have uh, some walls that are, um, that are in a part of the day uh, um, let's say getting shadow from from the surroundings. We have uh, walls that are more exposed to the sun, and uh, we can imagine that uh, these gener uh, can generate uh, um, some kind of cyclic behavior in terms of movement, as uh, Stefano presented. So this is the kind of uh, problem we wanted to study with uh, Diana. Uh, so here, for example. In, in more detail, I'll show the map of the Garicena Tower. This is on a specific day, on April 6th. So we can see that uh, we, we have uh, uh, quite different, let's say, thermal conditions. You can imagine, for example, at 10 a.m., that these sides are cooler, while these other sides are hotter, and then the situation uh, uh, during the day uh, gets changed. So um, it, it's a quite a, a, a complicated problem present by nature, but this is what we are trying to, to model, just to give an, an idea. Uh, so we, to try to answer uh, this, this question of um, can we associate the movement of the tower to, to thermal effects, we built the model using uh, Diana. As we will show you, we have uh, the temperature record for some extensometers that we use as uh, boundary conditions uh, outside. I will show you in a diagram. We also have the internal temperature of the tower that we use in this case, uh, the temperature that is recorded by the pendulum. And uh, we, we, what we did is uh, essentially what Stefano already showed in the, in the previous case. So uh, we had the thermal model coupled to a mechanical model. So we first evaluated the temperature distribution on the tower. Uh, and then this model was used as the input for the mechanical model to evaluate the resulting uh, displacements that were compared to the experimental results that we have because we have the, oh, sorry, the pendulum, uh, the recording of the pendulum movement. So in this case, we are not uh, yet analyzing stresses. We are interested in analyzing the displacement behavior to, to see if uh, what we have uh, has a bit of sense. Uh, just in terms of the uh, movement of the pendulum. So uh, we had to start the model with uh, some assumptions. So we have the, the temperature record outside on the extensimeters, and uh, it's just in actually in one point. So we, to start the problem, we consider that uh, the temperature remains constant throughout the whole height of the tower in the edge where the, this extensometer is, uh, is installed. And uh, we first uh, 
consider the model to be linear. Again, this is a this is a first approximation because we know this is a, a thousand year old tower. Um, we have uh, pro probably the damage effects, uh, cracks, uh, also uh, the the creep of the tower. Uh, it's uh, the behavior itself. It's it's very complex. But uh, we first assume the response to be entirely uh, linear as, as as a first approximation. And um, one point that is um, very difficult to consider is uh, what about the how to consider the transit aspect of this because the problem is inherently uh, transient if we think about it every minute every second every hour we have a different uh, orientation of the sun and a different thermal condition so what we did uh, we we assume that we know the the temperature variation uh, on the tower with respect to time, which is uh, true in a sense because we have the the sense the temperature sensor uh, uh, readings, and um, with this information because we consider a model that is linear, uh, we divided uh, our transit problem in a series of uh, in independent uh, steady state thermal studies to simplify the problem. It's important to note that, for example, Diana has the capability of uh, treating a, a transit uh, heat transfer problem, but because we wanted to have a kind of benchmark problem to to to, to know to compare and to, to validate. This was chosen as the the first uh, uh, first approximation, and um, so what we did is we we chose uh, to evaluate the behavior of, of the tower um, during one day. We chose a day in uh, April this year that uh, it was a day that we uh, reading the the pendulum displacement. We saw that the pendulum displacement in uh, both directions in the in the plane of the tower were high. So we decided to, to, to take this day as observation. And uh, we constructed uh, 12 boundary condition cases. Uh, each one represents a time period of uh, two hours. So we, take, uh, we took um, 12, uh, 12 um, temperature measurements. We assumed that, uh, let's say, this, this temperature remained constant throughout two hours. And uh, then we changed the temperature again. Um, so again, the, the boundary conditions that we applied were the, the temperature of each one of the four external walls and the internal temperature of, of the internal temperature of the tower. And uh, as Stefan showed, we are uh, we also have a fixed support in the in the ground in all cases. So um, one one important point that uh, Stefano already commented on is that we perform the differential analysis. So um, it's it's very hard in in our case to model a problem with uh, absolute uh, values, so absolute values of uh, temperature or also pendulum displacement, extensimeter displacement, uh, because of all the the let's say the nonlinear effects we had. So we we consider the differential cases. So for the temperatures, this means that uh, we, we we the temperatures used were the difference between uh, the temperature that were recorded and the average temperature of uh, for April. That is actually the, the, the average temperature for a year that Stefan showed before. And uh, to analyze the displacements of the model, we, we selected the first measure uh, recorded on that day, sorry, as, the, as, as our zero point, and we analyzed the trend in the displacement of uh, the pendulum and also the extensor mystery. So not the absolute value, but the variation of, uh, of the, the, the displacement uh, during time. Uh, to, to, to set up the model, so if you, if someone already uh, performed Diana, uh, performed thermoelastic simulations in Indiana, uh, probably already, already uh, knows what I'm talking about, but um, I'll show you later in a picture. We defined uh, fixed potentials in each wall where we know we had the temperature, uh, um, known value of uh, temperature. 
And uh, we, we applied this before uh, uh, applying the, the prescribed temperature boundary condition because this acts as a flag for Diana to, to, uh, to know that in, the, in this case we have a, a fixed um, um, a known temperature that is the primary variable of the, the thermal problem. And uh, we, we set the, the prescribed temperature boundary condition to match the ones where this fixed potential was defined. So here, for example, in our model, we, we defined these uh, in all the walls, the, these uh, fixed potential that tells uh, Diana that uh, this is a, a geometry set where the, the temperature is, is known, whatever that temperature is. And then we associated later the, the boundary conditions to, to it. This is how we, we modeled it in uh, Diana. Uh, so we had the boundary conditions for uh, each of the, the external walls that you can see here. Also for the, for the inter, um, internal walls of the tower. And uh, we have all the boundary conditions case. So uh, we have in a period of um, every two hours. So for example, the temperatures at midnight, 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m., so on and so on. This is how we modeled. And um, so more about the, the application of the boundary conditions, because it was a quite a bit of a, a challenging case. Um, the, like I said, we knew the temperature only in uh, four points, and uh, we assumed that this temperature was uh, uh, um, was constant throughout the the height in the outside. Inside, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, we assumed the temperature was constant equal to the one of, of um, the pendulum, and uh, we had to apply this uh, this condition that. Uh, we assumed that the temperature variation on each face of the wall was linear. This is uh, the difference between the model that I will show now and the model that Stefano showed before that considered uh, a constant temperature out, uh, on the outside walls. Uh, in this case, we applied a linear variation in, in, each, of the, in each one of the walls. So here I'm showing, uh, these are the points where the, we have the known temperatures because we have the measurements in the Garizena Tower. We have one in the other corner that is, is hidden. And we had and we considered basically that the temperature on these points were, uh, were the same through all, all the height of the tower. And uh, the, the linear behavior that, uh, that I showed is that uh, basically we, um, we assumed a linear variation from, from each, uh, each corner so on the base on the top to, to each one of, of the corners. Uh, of course, we had to guarantee that we, ha we had a, a continuity in temperature for the problem to, to make sense. And um, because this boundary condition is a bit uh, more, uh, let's say a bit more specific to what uh, one may find. For example, it is not constant. Uh, in, in Diana, normally when we prescribe a, a temperature boundary condition, uh, it's useful, um, usually defined as a constant value. Uh, since we needed to take into account this linear behavior, we used one of Diana's functionality that is the, de the definition of a, a function that was a spatial function. Uh, so it depended on the co on, uh, only on the spatial coordinates. So what we did, I'll show you, uh, we, we defined each wall as having a, a unitary temperature, one degrees, and um, this was multiplied by the user-defined function that we wrote to apply in this boundary condition. So it was dependent on the coordinates on the face wall, x or y, depending on what was the normal direction of the wall, and z, that is the, the height direction. And the one important thing that was, um, I think it was extra, not only useful, but necessary in our case is that uh, um, we calculated these values in Python um, because we had to do some uh, some interpolation, for example, some uh, more complicated math, and uh, we we applied it using Diana's Python API. So this is important to mention because uh, Diana has a Python API, so um, we can we can uh, do some very very uh, advanced modeling. Uh, by using already built-in uh, Diana functions uh, with Python. So 
this is extremely helpful. And uh, so these are the values, for example, that um, we define, as I said, um, we define here uh, a unitary temperature of uh, one degree that was multiplied by a function for each hour. And uh, we define the, the, this function in a set of points. Uh, for Diana users out there, an important remark is that um, uh, the, the functions are always defined as, uh, as far as I know, as, as agreed. So for example, in your case, we have a known temperature in uh, four points, and we are considering that uh, each one has uh, two coordinates because we are looking in the plane of the tower, uh, 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 wall, uh, wall of the tower, sorry. So we need to define uh, uh, two times four, so we have to define eight function values. That's why even though we have four known, uh, four known um, uh, temperature values, we, we, we have to define eight points. So this is basically what, uh, what we did in Diana. You can imagine this as, a, this one is as a, an arbitrary wall of the tower. Uh, the Garisenda, as Stefan showed, has a non-constant uh, non cross-section. So the top is a bit, uh, uh, the dimensions of the cross-section are, are a bit smaller, and we had to take this into account in our function. So we had the, the, the function values in, uh, in these yellow points, and we calculated uh, in Python the, the function values also on, the, on, the, on these black uh, grid points that Diana uses to, to apply the boundary conditions. And uh, we did this through Python and uh, Diana's uh, Python API. So now moving on to the uh, interesting part, this is, the, this is what we obtained. For example, this is the displacement of the, the tower. Uh, resulting from the thermomechanical uh, thermomechanical analysis, and uh, here is, for example, the, the the temperature profile of the of the outside and of the the core inside during during all the the hours of the of the day. Uh, we can see we got the, a, a good continuity of uh, always of the temperature in, in the in the corners and the linear variation in, in each one. So uh, to, to, to validate our model, let's say, or at least to, to compare with some experimental results, we chose to, to compare um, the model response. Um, the parameters we chose to evaluate were the in-plane uh, uh, in -plane, in -plane, uh, pendulum displacement uh, that we have as experimental measures. Uh, we compared with the in-plane uh, movement of the tower that we got uh, from, from Diana, X and Y uh, um, displacements, and also the virtual displacement of the, the external extensometers that we have, we compared with uh, the, um, this, the, the, this component of the displacement of nodes where the, these extensometers are in the model. So first, um, these are the, the this is the comparison between the the numerical displacement of the the vertical nodes where the extens the nodes where the extensometers are, and the experimental displacements. So for this case, we we are not quite there yet. The the displacements we have in um, in uh, in um, in the experimental case are are lower. We we are still trying to to find out how to for this case how to um, how to enhance how to optimize our model to better calibrate it to 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 match the experimental results. But what's interesting is this is the the result uh, the comparison of the um, displacement of the pendulum and of the tower. So uh, the here in blue we have the pendulum displacement. And in uh, pink, we have the displacement of the top of the tower. Uh, it seems they, they are, um, at a first glance, not, uh, they don't have quite a good correlation, but uh, two factors are very important. First of all, they, they are on the same order of uh, magnitude. Uh, without, um, so without doing any calibration, they are on the same order of magnitude. And the overall trend that we have here is the same. So here we can see, for example, that in, in the day we chose uh, 6th of April 2023, 
the the pendulum in the in the Garisenda move uh, towards uh, uh, northwest, and in the numerical model, uh, albeit slightly uh, with a very small displacement, it also moved uh, uh, in the let's say in the same direction. So what we can see about this, um, as I said, the the numerical displacements they are in the same order of magnitude. They present the same uh, the same trend that we have for these chosen days and hours. And um, the, um, from what we've seen, this simplified model is a good uh, starting point for the thermal mechanical for the thermal mechanical analysis of the tower. It's uh, for sure it's not yet uh, let's say a, a finished model, but uh, taking into account that this model is very simplified, that we are assuming, for example, the the temperature throughout the height mean constant, where in reality we don't know what the behavior is, and the consider yeah yet we don't know yet, and considering that the the model is linear and we have a tower that's a thousand years old and probably has a uh, already, uh, for example, permanent deformation effects uh, going on. We are, uh, sorry, we are, um, we think the model is, is good to start the calibration to better enhance the fit with the with the experimental results. So we are quite happy for, for now with it. Okay. So we thanks everybody for the attention and we will be happy to answer to the question uh if uh, if any mm -hmm. thank you very much thank you well first of all uh, let me speak uh, uh and say thank you to stefano and pedro for their nice and very comprehensive presentation it was very interesting and uh, also for for us at diana to see uh, diana involved in such a study and uh, see how you can use finite element model to interpret uh, the experimental results and try to, let's say, bring some valuable information to the structural assessment. Um, there are a lot of compliments. <laughs> First of all, let me share them. That's, uh, that's very good. There are, there are a few questions, and uh, I'm just going to scan, and that there is one which is, which is actually uh, very much in line with what we are facing uh, in Europe. Uh, for uh, your analysis, you, you considered uh, some average temperatures. Uh, what what is the time frame for this uh, average temperature? Because uh, someone is pointing out that with uh, this warming up, climate change, heat wave, this average temperature, of course, are increasing. So can can you elaborate a little bit more about the average temperature that you use? Uh, yes, uh, but the, the um, actually was a, was a um, let's say quite a, a reference value in the sense that uh, in, in the last year. Uh, in, in order to, um, let's say, to have uh, meaningful values from uh, the thermomechanical analysis. Because uh, if we simply apply the temperature starting from zero Kelvin, of course, we, we get very high deformation due to the thermal stress, uh, due to thermal, uh, let's say, loads. Uh, instead, um, we have to consider, in some sense, that, uh, uh, let's say, the, the material uh, which is made, the, which, the, which the tower is made of, uh, has already a certain temperature uh, when it's put into place during the construction, okay? So, it, we don't start from uh, uh, absolute zero materials yeah. and then we warm it up uh, because of the sun. So this choice of the uh, reference temperature is, uh, we, we um, let's say, assumed that is uh, what could be the mean yearly temperature to have uh, a, a good estimate from this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, differential situation. Um, of course, uh, it is true, I agree, that uh, the, the monitoring of the tower uh, being a continuous monitoring of uh, several uh, points uh, during, uh, let's say, not only one year, but maybe several years, 
could give also a trend of uh, climate change uh, in the last years. Uh, to be honest, we, we, we didn't look at it uh, yeah. in this sense yet, but uh, I, I agree that could, could be also. Um, usually, the, uh, there are uh, more devoted and precise, uh, uh, let's say, measurement if one, if one uh, to consider this aspect uh, directly from uh, a meteorological uh, stations. I should say. So the our monitoring of temperature, I don't know from if from a meteorological point of view, it uh, um, fits with the standards of uh, uh, let's say meteorologist. Okay, thank you for all this uh, clarification. If I understood the, the question correctly, okay? I think so, yeah, yeah, no, but uh, it was very much in line. So thank you for that. Uh, one more thing, uh, in one of your slides, you made reference to a video on our YouTube channel. Uh, it's good to mention that indeed, I mean, uh, a few years ago, you already presented some, some results of this uh, Gary Sender Tower. So this can, presentation can be seen as a follow-up. And uh, I would say, uh, if uh, I mean everybody agree with that, we may ask uh, Stefano and Pedro, uh, maybe in a certain period of time, also to come back with uh, some uh, update on this uh, on this uh, research because it's uh, it's quite yeah, interesting. Yeah. But uh, this maybe video can be found on our YouTube channel, the Diana IFA YouTube channel. Maybe it would be uh, uh, an idea for the future. Yes, and we have. Uh... We certainly have ideas of um, what we want to do now in, the, in terms of the um, assessment considering the thermal effects. So, uh, Stefano presented, for example, he mentioned acoustic emissions. Uh, it's interesting to see uh, if there is correlation between acoustic emission and temperature. For these, also analyze the thermal stresses to see, for example, if they are enough to, to to generate acoustic emission because we also have acoustic emission data so uh yeah we, i think in, in in some time we will certainly have some more material to share sounds very good i mean you are always welcome and uh we are happy to host you for for such a for such a technical webinar uh, stefano and pedro um there are more questions uh did you measure and model the heat capacity uh, of the tower materials? This is a question coming from John, to be more specific. Okay, we, we did not yet very precisely. We assumed, uh, let's say, tabular uh, mean values because uh, we were, uh, let's say, mainly working on uh, uh, first order model to see if the order of magnitude uh, could be reasonable. Um, consider that. Uh, um, our first evidence from both the pendulum but also the strain uh, uh, sensor and displacement sensor we had to the um, on the tower uh, is uh, that uh, there is a small amount of uh, this uh, displacement that uh, um, are, if not really reversible, at least um, cyc cycling values. So you, if you look at the diagrams of the continuous monitoring, there is a large amount of displacement that uh, goes and comes back. So uh, th this one cannot be, uh, of course, uh, um, let's say, ascribed to uh, non-linear evolution and damage propagation, I, I add uh, fortunately. But uh, it's not easy to understand uh, we, which is uh, and, uh, the real mechanism that is going on. So uh, by the moment we started to study the tower to see what, what was going on and then I'm sure we will have to face also the problem of uh, a better characterization from the thermal point of view of the different layers of the uh, of the tower. Well, thank you very much for your explanation. So there's still uh, quite some work to be to be done. I mean, uh, that's uh, yeah. also the interesting part of this uh, research. 
I'm not going to pick up any more any question because we have already exceeded a little bit the, the time allocated for this webinar. Uh, there are some questions which are very specific to Diana that I can address later on by email. Uh, I'd like, uh, in the name of Diana IFA and also in the name of the audience, to thank you all, uh, Pedro and Stefano, for uh, taking the time uh, of making having this presentation and sharing your uh, your experience with with Diana and also how Diana can be incorporated in your research. So uh, big thanks to you, uh, really appreciate, and it was really a pleasure to have you uh, as a guest uh, for this uh, technical webinar. And uh, yeah, uh, I would say if uh, everybody agree, we are going to end this webinar for today. Maybe you want to have a last word, uh, Stefano or Pedro? Yeah, thank you to you and to all the uh, attendees. Uh, and uh, see you soon. <laughs> yeah, hope to see you soon. Hope we we could clarify some um, some aspects of the methodology of this um, uh, uh, NDT monitoring, and also Diana. And uh, yeah, ho hopefully we'll um, we'll soon be be updating you. So uh, thank you, Jean Claude, and thank you, everybody. Thank you to both of you, uh, gentlemen, and uh, it was a, a great pleasure. And thank you to all the participants. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, after some post-processing and uh, things like that, uh, in, a, in a few days, uh, this uh, webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. So keep an eye uh, on, our, on our website. Thank you all, and uh, wish you to have a, a pleasant day. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.